Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining the Sportico, the NIL era event. We're honored that you would join us today, and what a day it's going to be. We have some of the most prominent speakers in the college sports industry ready to discuss the most important issue facing college sports in terms of the business of college sports, and that's name, image, and likeness. Beginning next year, college athletes will be able to sign endorsement deals, be paid for their autograph, be paid to sign apparel contracts, and sponsor camps, among other things. And this, is, of course, is a major change from how college sports has worked for decades, where athletes have been prohibited from any kind of compensation for their name, image, and likeness or anything else. So the big change is coming. But what's going to happen next? How will it be administered? Who will benefit? What will be the rules? And how exactly is it going to happen? We know that members of Congress, uh, state, state governments, and the NCAA itself, as well as conferences, all have voiced opinions on how we get there. So we're going to talk about those issues with some of the biggest speakers, including those who have helped make today happen, including in litigation and public advocacy. And we'll begin with our editor in chief, Scott Soschnick, who I'm going to turn over to right now. All right. Thanks, Mike. And you know what I say all the time at Sportico, what we want to do is make people smarter. And the way you do that is bringing in the smartest folks, the, the, the biggest experts. And Jay Billis is certainly one of those when we're talking about name, image, and likeness. Unique resume, a basketball player at Duke, a broadcaster at ESPN, and also an attorney. Uh, because his schedule is so crowded, I had to pre-record with uh, Jay yesterday. So for those of us of a certain vintage uh, who hang around the New York sports scene, I think you're going to understand this reference. Let's go to the videotape. Jay Billis, thanks so much for taking a few minutes and joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. And this takes me back. I got to say, though, seeing you and talking with you brings a little displeasure, although it's right on topic. The last time I had to reach out to you, I don't know, you won't remember, but I had a great scoop lined up that my friend Jeff Kessler was starting a college division at his firm. We had it all teed up, and then at like 9 p.m. the night before, there's Jay Billis with a tweet that Kessler's starting a college division. Do you remember that? Did I really? I don't know how I got that information. I, Maybe well, somebody I leaked you, it to me. I called and asked you, and you said somebody you didn't even know reached out just to let you know. So I was not Is happy right? with you. I was not happy. <laughs> but, well, I'm sorry. That's, that might have been my only scoop in all my years of, uh, of being yeah, in right, public Yeah, right life. out from <laughs> under me. But it does go to show that we've been talking about this for quite some time. So I ask you, I mean, I know you're familiar with the stages of grief. Where is the NCAA, the executives, where are they in the stages of grief over NIL? I mean, have we reached acceptance yet? Seems that they've accepted it, but they haven't accepted it. I think the viewpoint is still sort of backwards. And instead of looking at it from the standpoint of, you know, these uh, players, these athletes deserve full economic rights and we have to have a really good reason to restrict them here and there if we restrict them at all. Uh, and instead, their viewpoint is these athletes have only the rights which we allow, and let's see what we can all agree to allow them in a restrictive way. And you want to give sort of the NCAA, and by that I mean all the, the member institutions, some credit for moving even this slowly, but – you know, then you go, well, they're really being dragged into it by all these different states that have passed laws or, or have legislation pending uh, at public opinion, which has, has shifted totally against the, the idea that athletes should be restricted economically. Uh, it's just a hard place to be. I mean, I, uh, there are so many great people within the structure. And, you know, we, we may differ on certain ideas or policies, but uh, I, I, just, I just have a hard time believing that in this day and age, we're still arguing over whether an athlete can do a commercial and this entire enterprise is going to crumble as a result. I, I, I've never believed that, and I certainly don't believe it now. Has COVID accelerated perhaps the notion that because they're missing out on revenue, that maybe we're willing to accept anything and everything if there is a bigger piece of the pie that perhaps we can share it? I don't, I don't sense that. Uh, that may be discussed in certain, certain avenues, but I don't sense that. I see more of a, 
part of it's practical, some of it's craven, uh, but uh, their NCAA is sort of moving forward with Congress trying to get protection from Congress, where Congress would preempt all these different states and try to give an, an even landscape across the country, rather than the NCAA just taking the reins and, and passing uh, sensible rules uh, to allow full economic rights to players in a way that uh, that is somewhat manageable. I don't think it needs to be managed, you know, completely. Uh, but if if there are legitimate concerns about competitive balance, fine. But I don't see that there are legitimate concerns when you have, you know, unfettered spending on facilities and coaches' salaries and and everything you could possibly imagine within the the universe of college sports. And yet we have to control what the athletes are able to earn uh, or accept. Uh, otherwise, the entire enterprise teeters on the edge of, of legitimacy. And I just I've never believed that. I, and I don't think it's I don't think you can make a credible argument for that. It, it's it's all based out of fear that, that that boy, if we let the if we let these athletes out of the pen, it's all going to go to hell in a handbasket. And it's just not true, and it never has been. Is it short-sighted, though? I would think that with the infrastructure the NCA has in place, with the infrastructure that the universities themselves have in place, that perhaps a partnership with the players would be the best vehicle to, if this is coming anyway, maximize the revenue and share it. I agree with that. You, you would think that that would carry the day. Uh, and, and so it is a little bit surprising that the, the draft NCAA rules that, that are being put forward now, or at least that, that we've all seen, uh, disallow sort of the idea that you could use university marks along with an athlete, uh, you know, athlete commercial or advertisement. Uh, it seems to me those are untapped, uh, you know, revenue streams where, you know, same as, as the NFL does or the NBA um, you know, they don't have to, the NFL doesn't have to agree to do a, a soup commercial with Saquon Barkley using the New York Giants logo. Uh, but, but when they do agree, it can be beneficial for everyone. And I think the same is true for, uh, for the NCAA and for the member institutions that, you know, you, you could certainly tie advertising to a particular team using the university logo and the athlete's name, image, and likeness and where it benefits everyone. Um, but they don't seem willing to do that. And because really the institutions look at it as, wait a minute, this is our money. Like the, the players are, are coming into an area where all of this is our money and we're not going to give them our money. So if we've got a deal in place, they cannot do anything that conflicts with university deals. And that makes no sense to me. That's something that you would put on an employee that employee would agree to it, in an arm's length negotiation in an employment contract, not that you give to a student who's to be treated like any other student. And, and honestly, I mean, even though I, I, I like the people that are putting forward these ideas, some of these ideas are so foolish, it's hard to imagine that, that you're talking about, okay, the athletes need to choose. They can monetize their name, image, and likeness, or they can accept a scholarship and nothing else. And that's not told to any non-athlete that accepts a scholarship. Uh, so what, what they're really saying is are, are coming into an area where all of this is our money and we're not going to give them our money. So if we've got a deal in place, they cannot do any university deals. And that makes no sense to me. That's something that you would put on an employee that employee would agree to in an arm's length negotiation in an employment contract not that you give to a student who's to be treated like any other student. And, and honestly, I mean, even though I, I, I like the people that are putting forward these ideas, some of these ideas are so foolish, it's hard to imagine that, that you're talking about, okay, the athletes need to choose. They can monetize their name, image, and likeness, or they can accept a scholarship and nothing else. And that's not told to any non-athlete that accepts a scholarship. Uh, so what, what they're really saying is that, that the, the scholarship to an athlete is pay, it's compensation. We're going to cap it, but we're not going to do the same for a, a music scholarship or a journalism scholarship or any of the scholarship. They can accept that. They can accept a stipend and they can earn or accept whatever they want in the marketplace with no restriction. Um, it, it really, none of this makes any sense.
there is nothing more enjoyable than your Twitter feed when you do expose some blatant hypocrisy where you don't have to make the argument. You just allow it to be made by, by its, its own existence. Have we seen or has the hypocrisy been exacerbated during the pandemic, whereas you can have kids on campus, but you can certainly stage football games uh, or other sports? Well, I, I think it exposed that those arguments couldn't be sustained going and, and honestly, I, I, haven't, I haven't really used those type of things as hypocrisy in this because th th these are really difficult times. I don't really feel like I should be pulling out sort of the idea. When, when early on, Mark Emmert said, uh, no students on campus, no college sports. Well, I knew that that wasn't true. You I knew, knew that, that wasn't going I knew that was, yeah, I, I knew that that wasn't going to be sustained. But, but. I think the I think the NCAA and all the member institutions, you know, the business aspect of this is really important. There's a lot riding on this, a lot of jobs and a lot of livelihoods. And and to me, the decisions that are being made right now of playing through the pandemic and, and all that, e even if you have to quarantine teams and play in bubbles and all that stuff, I, I don't think that makes the players pros. I think they're pros already. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna start banging on people over that. I, I don't think it's worth that uh, sort of those kind of those scoring those kind of what I would call cheap political points, even though they're accurate, um, because they backed off of everything. Say like, you know can't play in bubbles. They're playing in bubbles. The Rutgers president, excuse me, I'm I'm forgetting the name, uh, says recently uh, you shouldn't be asking us why we're not playing. You should be asking the other conferences why they are, and you'll find out in November and December, and then. A week or 10 days later, votes as part of unanimous uh, group of presidents to start playing again. And by the I way, mean, at the, a university that not long ago was one of the most subsidized athletic departments in the nation, telephones out of professors' offices. Right. I mean, just the contradictions are, are, are all over the place. And to me, like, and I'm going a little bit uh, on a tangent here, which I'm, I'm prone to do. We've got but, some time. You know, Go ahead, Jay. The, the, idea, the idea that that the players are the ones with a choice here, that if they don't like the restrictions that are put on them, they have the choice not to play, which I think is a false choice, ignores the choice of the universities here, that, that not only do they have the choice not to play big-time college sports, but they have the choice Division three, If they think that that's more aligned with their stated mission, then go, you know, nothing's stopping you from going to play in Division Two or Division Three and not giving scholarships at all. Like if Ohio State doesn't feel like allowing name, image, and likeness rights, go into Division Three and you can play Amherst and uh, Williams College at the Shoe on Saturday for free admission and no television, um, and see how you like that. Uh, I don't think that'll happen, um, but but it sort of ignores the choice. Like the schools are making a choice to play big time college sports and. In my judgment, they ought to let the athletes participate in the enterprise. Uh, if it's hey, if they're old enough to, if they're old enough to be sold for billions of dollars, they're old enough to share in it. What kind of dollars do you think are realistically at stake here? I, I think that the athletes themselves hear name, image, and likeness, and they think there's a great payday at the end. I think that's true. Okay. Okay. We'll I see think what that's I true. Zion Williamson, think. not true for the vast majority of the athletes. What do you think the expectation is uh, in sort of your, let's just say, random offensive lineman that I would not know, but perhaps has something, you know, some opportunity in a local market? Well, I think, I think name, image, and likeness rights are going to open up a lot of avenues for revenue that we're probably not even thinking about right now. And it goes more, it, it will go more toward those who are creative, and and think outside the box than just the the name brands that we're thinking about now and to me i think a lot about um how we you know how we look at value in other areas of the enterprise i mean we, we could make sort of the same argument if coaches were unpaid right now and they, they were provided their expenses only we would probably make those same kind of arguments if we didn't want to allow coach pay by saying yeah you know coach k or nick saban they're going to make a ton of money, but we're not going to see these assistant coaches or strength coaches making a lot of money and look how much they make. I mean, offensive linemen aren't, you know, don't seem really valuable until you have to protect a really good quarterback. 
and then they're really valuable. And so, uh, you know, some of their, some of what they have out in the marketplace is going to be determined by the market they're in. Some of it will be determined by their personality, uh, the spotlight that they may or may not have on them. Uh, look, I've seen over the years, you've seen walk on basketball players that have started their own, you know, sort of media enterprises. And even though they couldn't monetize them at the time, gained significant notoriety off of it. Uh, of the punter from UCF had a YouTube channel, had to choose between continuing to play football or monetizing a, a YouTube channel. You don't have to make that choice anymore. Right. So I, I don't know the, the answer. Like, like generally, I think that's right, that not everybody is going to make the same thing. But that, that's like saying, well, well, you know, coaches don't all make the same thing. But, but assistant coaches do pretty darn well. And I think we'll see the same thing for players. Well, the clearest indication to me that at least somebody sees the great value out there is that you're starting to see the private equity shops sniff around the college rights. So if they see value in group license uh, and the collective possibility, you really get a sense that perhaps we're missing something, that it's not just about video games or a one-off deal for Zion, that what can they do, a little video games, um, as, as a collective group? Yes, and I think that's a, another area where there are untapped revenue streams. So whether it's group licensing, whether it's licensing uh, individual teams or players sharing in uh, merchandising, whatever it may be, there are all sorts of revenue streams out there. Uh, and, you know, look, we've, we've talked about some of these things before, sort of the idea that uh, people say, well, jersey sales don't really amount to very much uh, in the grand scheme of things, but they're part of a larger whole. And so, you know, the, the jersey sales go as part of a gigantic uh, apparel deal that a school does with an apparel company. Uh, so what's to, you know, who's to say that players and, and universities won't start doing apparel deals with players and why they shouldn't be allowed to do it? Uh, you know, if we can have athletes that are playing college football, but yet they're professional baseball players at the same time and making money while they're in school. And, and we're okay with that line of demarcation. Somehow we're, we're able to say amateur in one sport, professional in another, therefore amateur and we're okay with it. Um, we can certainly do it on the name, image, and likeness side. And I don't think we're far off from the universities being able to cut deals with the players altogether. Because once that, you know, the NCAA has said forever, you, you know, you sell yourself, in the marketplace, you're a pro. Well, once they do that, how are they going to argue in court anymore that they're amateurs? You know, they, they, they've used that argument forever that, that nope, they're pros. And I think even Mark Emmert said under oath, once they do commercials, they're professionals and they're shills for products. And I, I find that frankly offensive, but, but, you know, he said it under oath, he must believe it. Uh, and I, I, I've always known that to be untrue. Like, you know, money and education are not mutually exclusive. That's proven by the fact that, that every non-athlete is allowed to go to school and, uh, and accept a scholarship and whatever else they want from the school and can even work for the school if they choose and accept whatever they, they can earn in, in the marketplace without any sort of, of sanction from the university or uh, or restriction, I should say, from the university or, or anyone else. And, you know, to me that speaks volumes about how, you know, sort of how ridiculous the system is that we've, we've fashioned and, and how it needs to change. And, and I think it is changing, but it needs to change faster. Like this is going too slowly. Well, do you get the sense that the athletes themselves now have a much better understanding of the issues and then to an even greater import, their power that they have? We saw Missouri football, Kane Coulter, Northwestern, you get the sense that, and even in the professional setting, this, this athletes and activism, I'm getting a sense that it's, it's really empowering the college athlete to say, perhaps there's something bigger than just playing in the Rose Bowl or playing in the Final Four, that we can exact lasting change, and we ought to flex if we can. I, I absolutely believe and, and have seen that happening. Uh, the National Association of Basketball Coaches put together uh, a group of players as, as sort of a committee uh, on, on different issues, not only of social justice, but, but in other areas. And, and I know those players are, are looking at how they can uh, collectively 
make their voices heard in this and many other areas. So the players do know that they've got leverage here, sort of the old uh, line from the, the right stuff movie of the eighties, no bucks, no buck Rogers, you know, they, they know without them, there are no games. And uh, so they do have significant leverage. You know, it, it, now would I, would I be concerned about uh, making sure that that's done, you know, done right, if you will, so that, uh, uh, you know, it's not seen in the wrong light. I mean, I think anyone else other than a college athlete right now that, that stood up and said, wait a minute, we're worth more than this. And we should be allowed, just like everyone else, to compete for these dollars in the marketplace. I think, I think most people would be sympathetic to that. But for some reason, there's a segment of the population that doesn't want their games interrupted for any reason. So, and I don't think it's more than that. I, I, I think it was the same idea with conference realignment and all that. They're like, look, I like it like this. Don't mess with my games. I want to watch Kansas, Missouri. I want to watch Nebraska in the Big 12, all that stuff. Um, so I, I don't think it's this staunch opposition to money in, a, in college athletics. Uh, people aren't turning the TV off for that. I know that. Um, it, it's just sort of an idea of, you know, don't mess with it. All I want to do is watch the games and, and gamble on the games and enjoy the games and tailgate and go to the final four. If it, if it messes with that, I don't want to hear it. That, that's where I think the pushback is. Well, I, you know, I go back to something David Stern told me. We were walking down 7th Avenue one time. It was during the NBA lockout. I believe it was 98. I mean, sad that you have to remember which lockout, right? Um, but some guy leaned out of his window driving by, saw David, wasn't quite the middle finger, but there was an F-bomb dropped about, I'm done, I'm never watching again, you guys stink, the whole. And David looked at me and he said, that's the guy I don't worry about. That passion for him rolling down the window and screaming at me, I got him, he'll be back. And that's how I feel at college sports on the, and the fans. They're so passionate about, they're not going to give it up no matter what happens. They need that Saturday fix. Well, yeah, and I think that's been proven, and that's yeah. what most reasonable economists will tell you is that at folks that say that that money and, and you know big time college sports that it's ruining it, um, you know look look what look what administrators said back in the '80s when you had the Board of Regents case that opened up you know college football and and being you know conferences being able to sell their games without the NCAA telling them when they could be on television. And you had people actually saying, this is going to ruin college sports, that nobody's going to come to the games anymore, that they're just going to watch it on television. There's going to be an oversaturation, and, and, and this is going to be the end of it. You, know, you had really smart people saying that, and it was nonsense. Similarly, I think a lot of the stuff, the doomsday scenarios that are being put out now, the idea that if you could if a university could provide money or boosters could provide money in recruiting, it's going to ruin college sports. I think that's equally nonsense. Uh, and somehow it would tip this level, this mythical level playing field that we have. We don't have a level playing field. We never did. We certainly don't now. All you have to do is look at the rankings every year in football. I mean, Alabama just was declared number one for the 13th consecutive year. Uh, that, that's, not, that's not parody and it's not a level playing field. And look, I'm not taking a shot at Clemson or Alabama or Duke or North Carolina in whatever sport. That's all fine. But we don't have caps on facility spending. We don't have caps on coaches' salaries. We don't have, we don't have revenue sharing for uh, media rights deals or uh, apparel deals or merchandising or all that stuff. We only have restrictions on athletes. And, and I find that profoundly unfair uh, and, and to the point of, of being morally wrong. And uh, uh, I, think, I think a lot of people see that now. And the fact that you have so many states that have passed name, image, and likeness laws or have legislation pending um, should tell you that it's over. And, and the NCAA is being dragged into this and, and, and still, still fighting, still lobbying before Congress and still making you know, the same tired old arguments that frankly, uh, long-term, uh, aren't going to be sustained. All right. Well, Jay Billis, thanks for playing leadoff on our conference today. Well, Ricky Henderson, you good with that? Like Mickey Rivers, who, who's your leadoff guy? 
I, well, I remember Mickey Rivers. I, I mean, it, it, if I could be as good as, at anything as Ricky Henderson was at batting leadoff, uh, I'd be, be very happy. So that's a nice compliment. Thank, thank you for having me. It's been great to be with you. All right. Thanks, Jay.